Hello out there. Hello out there. This is your friend James. I'm very tired. I've been working um, a lot and I'm trying to cut back my workload. I have a problem saying no. I say yes too much. My birthday's coming up and I think that I gotta take some time to not say yes. I've worked very hard. I wanna enjoy life. I'm enjoying life a little bit more, but it's a lot. I work too much, too much a control freak, too much. I don't trust people how to do things correctly, and I get tired. And I was on the road for almost two weeks, and now I'm back, so I missed a couple. I apologize. Here's the thing, though. I have a catalog of great stuff, and I'm sure you haven't seen most of it, let alone all of it. So when I have a pod that I did a while ago and I haven't had a chance to do one, I do a rerun, and it's okay. Here's the thing. With this pod, I did this pod for one reason and one reason only. To build the fans that come to see me. I cannot play comps anymore. I cannot. Um, There's so much to go through, but, like, I I can just tell you, I did the other night, I did did this great club recently, and each first show of the night was incredible. And the second show was halfway good, and then the drunk kicked in and it felt like 2005 when clubs were like or 2000 and felt like 2006 5 2004 two, <laughs> felt like 2004 which is 20 years ago and that is when you go out and you have a killer first show and everyone's there and then um the next show you're fucking babysitting that's tough man and I haven't had that feeling in a while because people were so drunk. I got a lot of dates coming up. Stand up on one side, cons on the other. Coming to a city near you. But if I only want to go out and play places that like fucking like my shit, you know what I'm saying? I can't, I can't just do shows and have people don't know who they're seeing. Like some people just buy tickets and it's like, yo, you're buying tickets. Do you know who you're coming to see? Like, I did a joke the other night. A joke, I got to retire Malibu. People recognize me, blah, blah, blah. And half of these people, I do a joke. I say, you know, I love when people shout out jobs to me. What, what if I did that to people? You know, what's up, Bed Bath & Beyond? And the fucking people didn't know the Malibu. These people had never seen the movie. They just bought tickets to a comedy club. It's like, what are you doing? I guess that happens on all levels, though, but if you're playing 18,000 people, it's okay if 900 got dragged along by their friends because you still have, you know, 17,100 that know who you are. But I don't know. I do so many things. That's my problem. I'm a Gemini. I should just quit everything and do nothing or act or just write or just produce or just do comedy or just do this pod, or just do radio, or just do cons, or just sell merch, or just manage a Duncan. Like, I just do too many things, and I'm pulled in too many directions. Or just be people's therapist. Um, So much to go over. I'll try to stay focused. If I'm not, somebody fucking send me a mental telepathy message so I can focus here. Uh, This will be a mishmash of many things. Um... So, yeah, so I got the YouTube. We got the Patreon. The Patreon really was because of stuff we can't say on YouTube. Um, Give me ideas. I need to grow this Patreon. I should put out more content. I had to probably put out better content. So this amazing uh, video with Mr. Beast, and he's like, oh, the algorithm hates me. He goes, the algorithm doesn't hate you. He goes, you're just making bad content. (laughs) And I was like, that's brilliant. He's right. I watched three Mr. Beast videos, and I'm like, I couldn't turn him off. He's He is a YouTube fanatic. He's obsessed, and that's why he's the biggest and the best, and he'll be the biggest. He's on his way to becoming the biggest entertainer, like, of all time in terms of, like, revenue, numbers, views. Like, it's his 261 million subscribers. Uh, that is, like, a 2% of the planet. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's fucking on his way. But probably, like, 40% of the actual internet planet. You know what I mean? Like, that can get him. So he's just... But he, you know, he's brilliant. But he has all these philosophies, and he's like... 
He literally is amazing. Watch his video with Howie. I did Howie's pod. Howie's got an amazing studio, by the way. Uh, also, very inspiring. Um, that's what I'm trying to do now. Set up my own little area that I own. This is all rented right now, but it's it's good. But I want like I, exactly what Mr. Beast literally sleeps in this studio. It's in the video. I'm sure he has a house too, but like a loft where you live and you work. It's great. Um, so he's just an animal, but he's basically saying the algorithm doesn't hate you. He's just not making good content. It's not engaging. Uh, and I know that, but I'm, I've done a lot of things in my life that are engaging. And right now I'm just thinking about how just to get things off my chest. But the only thing we're going to have left in a few years is real interactions because the rest of it is going to be digitized. And that's just the case. People cannot admit it if you want. Um, and shout out Def Noodles. He's got an amazing club. I toured with him today. I toured it. Uh, he's got an amazing setup. Also giving me a lot of pointers. Um, and he hit me to, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but he hit me to holograms, which I already knew about. So he was like, I was like, oh yeah, holograms. He's like, that's going to be the thing that destroys Hollywood more than anything. And I said, how? And he said, I said, we already have holograms. I saw him 10 years ago with Tupac. He's like, no. He's like, holograms. And he then showed me, a little, told me about the George Carlin special where AI completely did a new special with George Carlin on his takes on things, but all new. And the George Carlin estate, I guess, had them take it down. But think about that. And death was like, just blew my mind at 1130 this morning. I was like, what? Because I knew a lot of things, but basically they can take any brand that you like as a comedian and completely give them a new hour every week. And it'll be on fresh takes through the internet with their voice, with AI. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> it's like, it's so, so, so if you're a younger comedian, his whole MO, Def Noodles, I'm giving you all the credit for this, is that it's going to be harder for you to break through when the legends come back to life. But my, I posted back on him and I said, well, what you're doing, he's starting a whole new comedian ecosystem, uh, which a lot of people are. Um, we've got the big clubs here in town and there's a lot of smaller clubs and they're in their own ecosystems. And you know what? They have their own fan bases. So I think it will be a wild, wild, wild time. Um, but I think that, you know, we're all just trying to get eyeballs. And obviously, eyeballs are going to go where eyeballs go. But eventually, we're never going to be able to do a joke because it's already going to be done. AI is going to beat everyone to the punch, literally. So, I don't know. I don't know how many more jokes I can say because I already said like five things last week and I saw them and people were posting versions of them and I'm pretty sure that I had an earlier watermark, but I can't stop it. And then people are going to go, that was my idea. You know what I mean? So it's like, you got. I don't know how we're ever going to be able to keep an original thought because everyone can share. I mean, there's people that have just similar takes and then there's other people that are just like, um, might see your thing and steal it or other times you might get crypto amnesia, you know, I'm, 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 I'm guilty of that. I've probably seen some stuff and got, you know, there's a fine line between, uh, inspiration and crypto amnesia, right? So there's a lot of, it's just going to be, I don't know. I don't know how you can ever really do an original piece anymore. It has to literally be about you going to Ralph's by yourself with your own shit because you can't talk about, you can't take takes on anything because there's going to be a lot of people that have a lot of takes. Like if you look at Trump and go, he's got orange hair. Okay, that's the simplest take. Well, there's going to be 10 billion people that say that. So it's not an original. You have to be first, I guess. But that's going to be impossible. So I don't know. Um, and I, there's a whole other thing I was going to do. There's a whole uh, AI. I, there's a song generator. It's incredible. Um, I just was shown to me by Kyle. Shout out, Kyle. And, uh, fuck, man. This thing is... I don't even know. Like, why I'm so tired is because I'm I'm just completely overwhelmed with information. I just can't do it anymore. I'm like... Bleh, 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 bleh. It's like, I get... I don't go to sleep, right? I catch at 1 a.m. And then I can't, can't get to it directly because I'm small, flying into a slower, a smaller city. So I got a layover in Charleston, you know, $11, $12 slice of pizza, going to a carb coma... Get on another 39-minute flight, 
Fucking turbulence, turbulence, turbulence. More than we've ever had. Wondering, hopefully it's not a fucking Boeing. Land. Okay, fucking rent a car. Okay, get a rent a car. Fucking someone drives me. Jason takes me to the hotel. Check in. Argue with the lady about an early check in. Go in there. Have a dumb can. Fucking take magnesium. Okay, scroll, scroll. Fucking pass out for four hours. Wake up. Drive to the club, do a fucking dinner fucking show. Fucking hi afterwards, go to the thing, wake up, meet and greet, how you doing, take pictures. Hey man, I lost Tremor 7. Boom. Fucking eat an onion ring, go back, fucking go on stage, wake up, deal with drunk idiots, they're too drunk. <gasps> fucking go back in, get in the fucking thing, sell some old merch. <laughs> And then, fucking, okay, let me find a place. No place is catering to us. We find one fucking rib joint. Go to the rib joint. We close in 20 minutes. I have to order a quick, order a big-ass plate of ribs. Go into a meat coma. Go home. Sleep. Fucking, scroll, scroll, scroll. You know, fucking touch the worm. Fall asleep. Fucking bleh, wake up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Do it all over again. Oh. It's like, I just, it's fucking eat, sleep, merch, joke, plane, pod, con, sig, eat, sleep, merch. To, so I got to take a break. So I was in Vegas. It was the closing of the trop. Just an amazing, just an amazing thing to see. You know, I'm old school. It's one of the last old school comic uh, hotels. I love the Cosmo. I love the new fountain blue. I love the wind, but I'm like also just appreciate amazing Vegas. And um, someone has been going to Vegas since 1997. Uh, no, 96. In summer of night, when I was 26 years old, it was the first time I ever went to Vegas, which is literally half of my life, a little more than half of my life. And once I went, I started going. But the very first thing I ever went in Vegas is I went shot a movie called Sparkler and we went up and different people were in the movie and one of the stars of the movie was Freddie Prinze Jr., one of his first movies and he was playing this rap tape and he's like, yo, listen to this and he's like, colder than a polar bear's toenails. And I was like, what is that? He's like, this is the new show, bro, Outcast. And he just kept playing Outcast. Colder than a polar bear's toenails. And I just remember three things about that trip is that first time I was in Vegas, we were literally shooting a scene in front of the Flamingo, which I didn't know what it was. It was the big torch. And I was like, I'm in Vegas shooting a movie. Like, how crazy is this? Like, it's like, this is a movie. Like, I'm in a movie in my life shooting a movie. This is a movie that I'm shooting a movie in Vegas. I remember that. I remember listening to that rap and going, these are amazing rappers him telling me what outcast was and i also remember him being a brilliant mind and they were touting him as this beautiful doe-eyed leading man but i'm like this dude's got fucking he's quick as fuck he's fucking boop and then i realized his father was the late great freddie prince senior who was you know left us before his time and the guy had you know freddie has matinee Amazing looks, but he's got the mind of a fucking hardcore fucking New York fucking street comedian. So I was, I was like, three things were popping in my brain. I'm like, this dude is razor sharp wit, introducing me to some new hip hop that I never heard, and I'm in Vegas. That was what I remember about that book. But being, I'm just gonna stand the Vegas part. Um, I always love Vegas and. I was there. Fuck, I could probably just rant for about six hours right now. And I really, I had a place in Las Vegas in 2003 for four years. And I had an accountant and he says, you can claim the citizenship and save the taxes. But it was very hard to prove that you were there a hundred and eighty three days or whatever of the year. You have to go you know, exactly at over one day over. And the receipts, I had an assistant. I would send them up there, and I'm like, go to the fucking mini mart and buy some shit. 
And he would stay in my house for a couple of days and work up there remotely, and he would buy shit. And play. So I was up there. I'm admitting to a fucking crime, I guess. Um, I changed my license and all this, but I don't think I ever really got the write-off because I could never really prove to the government that I was there enough. But a lot of people did it. I bought in this amazing development, and there was second and third homes. And I loved it. It was in Summerlin. Um, and my brother was like, Vegas could run out of water. You ain't ever going to be there. And then my friend Scott was like, why do you have a house here when you could just go to any hotel and say, count me, give me a fucking room. Because I was doing so many trips to Vegas. I would go to premieres out there. I would, you know, they'd pay me to go to a club appearance. And I, I'm, he's like, you never stay at your house. Like, I, li- my buddies still live there. I just said, they take my house for a while. So I sold it. I made good money. My brother, even though he annoyed me about it, he was right. And I made great money. Um, never really got the tax benefit. Then my house went down, so I could have bought it again even cheaper, and now it's back up. Uh, but when I was there, it was early, and then it's just Vegas is just booming, and I was just, I went back and I hung with my buddy after we closed the trough, and, you know, it was incredible. And then I stayed with my buddy, and I went to the Wynn, and I stayed at the Virgin in the Wynn. And, uh, I mean, between eating... Like, I was eating with him at Cipriani, like, the best. And then, like, gambling. Like, they got all these machines you can just lock in and gamble by yourself. No one fucks with you. And I probably, he got tired. He's like, you, you're you crazy. And I go to many properties. So I would go from the Trop, walk to the MGM, catch an Uber to Mandalay Bay, go up to the Wynn, hang with him, go to Aria, and then... Sometimes I go to this, the Barbary Coast or the other one that has an amazing jambalaya place. Emerald, I don't know. Then I go by the Rio just to walk through it. So it's like six casinos, and it takes me a couple hours. Well, more. It takes me like half the, half the, but I'll be up until like four. And then I'll, I'll go by the Oyo, and then I'll go home and sleep at the Virgin. So, because there is a, those are, that's a good test of different vibes. Um, I didn't go to Palms this time. But the thing is, is that, there's so much going on. Like I was in the Mandalay Bay, and it's so big and so busy but quiet. And there was just a band there on Monday night, and they were just playing every genre from 311 to fucking Led Zeppelin to Elton John. And these guys were incredible. I don't know who they are. You see this video. They they play Monday night at the Mandalay Bay in the bar, and I stopped doing what I was doing and watched them for an hour. Smoked a cigar. It was insane. But, like, then I would go out, grab a sandwich somewhere. I Ubered everywhere. I spent so much money on Ubers. I have to get a car if I go. What am I trying to mumbling about? I'm telling you that Vegas is more busy than it's ever been. And you don't have to stay in L.A. to do stuff. So I think that I'm going to go and I'm going to get a place in Vegas and also L.A. Because I think that I need to really. There's so much to do before you even leave the strip. And there's so much to do off the strip that I just could just. Keep going around, and I don't know. My I, my brain would be it would take me two years to really get to town. And I've been to Vegas. You can say safely. I mean, I've literally taken a plane to Vegas. I mean, people uh, honestly, maybe a hundred times. I might have been to Vegas a hundred times, which is a lot. Like a hundred times, I've gone that from Burbank to Vegas, like for anything and it's just it's just so much more in the sphere i just would stand out in front of the sphere and just i was marveling at it um and fuck man the west gate is bomb like i go to eight places there's a new benny hanas tell me if i'm mumbling but what i'm trying to tell you is is that there is so much happening that i think it's a great compliment to la and i think a lot of people are going to try to they're already doing it and there's just live entertainment. There's filmed entertainment. I know so many people there. There's just adventures around the corner. I I love the gambling scene. I love the comedy scene is booming. There's music. There's a food scene. Like, it's... What's not to like? I really am going to miss the trop in terms of late. Like, I want to do... I want to have a show in Vegas that I can do at, like, 1 a.m. That's really what I want to do. Like, I did a couple late night shows at the Trop, but, you know, they had certain rules and you couldn't go because it was union and I love it. But I literally see myself having a show in a lounge. 
Like, I, that could be one thing that I really... I fucking love lounge lizards. I love Leisure Suit Larry, if you know what that is. And I just... That's how you become an amazing comedian. You don't go and die in Vegas anymore. You Some of those lounge lizards would be legends had they had fucking social media, right? So you there's so many people. There's this bar in Texas, and they do like a two-step. And their TikTok is blowing up because it's just, it's a really fascinating world of the two-step and all these uh, women are dancing in it, and it's, and it's a totally different thing. It's like, and it's just, I don't know, somewhere in Texas. And it's like, it doesn't have any national media, but it's huge because it's online. So that's what I'm saying. You can be anywhere now, cause a scene. If you build it, they will come. A la the, you know, the goat Rogan, who literally is proving the model with, he brought media and comedy to Austin. And it's the biggest thing. Like, it, it's proving the model of, of, of how if you build something great, they will come and he they stake a claim, you know. So it's like I think these little communities obviously not going to be as big as his, um, but you can have these little communities, you know. And I don't know. I can't just go to Palm Springs and do it because there's I, I, there's not a lot for me to do out there. Other, I would like relax, but I get bored. But like Vegas, I think you can build. There's still a lot of building to be done. I have people telling me today I should put a club in the burbs. So I don't know. That's what I'm mumbling about. But I'm really impressed with what Vegas is doing. If they run out of water, my brother was right. Um, hopefully they don't. He keeps telling me they're going to run out of water. I was flying over Lake Mead. I don't remember going in that way. But Jesus Christ, I didn't know it, was a, it looked like the ocean. I was like, where's the ocean at? There's a new ocean they built. Oh, they're putting a beach. They're putting a fucking billion-dollar beach in off of around the corner from the Virgin. So you got the Virgin here. You make the right. Then you go down to MGM. So for MGM's here, Virgin's here, and then F, the Formula One is right here. There's a whole acres of stuff. That's going to be a huge beach. They're building a beach in the middle of the city. Brilliant idea. Saudi Arabia move. So that's where my mind's going right now. Comedy, pods, touring, merch. So let's go into this other situation. Diddy. <sighs> Uh, I'm going to comment as much as I can. The rabbit hole is the rabbit hole. But, look, you had Epstein, which should have been bigger than it was. I mean, it was huge. But do you know anybody that's been taken down that we know of, of note? Like, there's that one guy that owns Victoria's Secret, I guess. But I don't know if he's still around. Is he in, alive? Is he in jail? Whatever. So, I just remember hearing about Diddy in 95 um, or 94. He went from, like, zero to hero, literally, like, a back of a video dancer to his own label to a $50 million deal within, like, three years. And everyone's like, this dude is the hustler of hustlers. And I was like, damn, that's, like, incredible. And it was so inspiring. I'm like, how did this guy do it? You know, it was just, and it just was like, you know, he came across as a move maker. This is a crazy story. Not really crazy, but. You know, obviously that was a golden era of rap. Rap was huge, and then it got a little quiet, and then a golden era of the 90s, early to mid-90s rap. And he was a huge part of it, obviously, with Biggie. I was at MTV, 96 Awards, and I was sitting with my buddy Al, and at that year, the, one of the biggest songs was Every Breath You Take, the remix with Did Diddy did for Biggie. And I'm getting in there, and I'm sitting in my seat, and sure enough, who sits in front of me? My first award show ever, my first televised media event ever, Puffy. And I was like, oh, shit. And his, and he had, like, one person with him. It wasn't crazy. And I was just so impressed with his hustle, how he was everywhere. He was on the corner of Ro cover of Rolling Stone and music and labels. He was all over MTV that I was like, I, I, you know what? I don't bother a lot of people, but I'm like, I'm going to bother him because I just want to tell him what I think, how great he is doing. And so I had nothing going on in my life. I just was in Scream. We were up for best movie. And, um, you know, I was, you know, as meek as the day is long, Randy Meek. And I just, he was wearing some jersey, and I think it said Smalls on. It said 96. It was something, but it was like he was wearing a jersey. And 
I tap him on the shoulder and I go, I go to my buddy, I go, should I say something? He goes, yeah, say something. So I go, and I'll never forget, I just tapped him very lightly and he goes, <laughs> and I go, yo, man, sorry. I go, just want to tell you, I'm a big fan. And he goes, he goes, all right, cool. He didn't know me, knew nothing. And I think that year he went up to collect a few awards, present, and I was, you know, everybody knew him. And I, at some point, got called up. I think Nev or, or Wes or both said, hey, and when we got, we won Best Picture. It was a crazy upset and scream one. And then I went up on stage and I was like, and then he was like, oh, shit, that's good behind me. Like, so I actually went up, like, but he had no idea who I was. And that was like my first foray foray into the public consciousness, if you will. I mean, it was already from the movie, but now, and the cast was blah, 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 and Jimmy Kennedy, you know, so, um, that was my, it's kind of crazy, all the interactions I've ever had, which were very small, this is going to be very unpopular with a lot of people, but it was always cool to me, obviously, because, you know, they were very brief, and, you know, I was becoming a celebrity, and he was already, you know, a, a godfather of celebrities, and, uh, I don't know anything about him, but I think ev- I think I had three interactions with him, and he, every time was at an MTV party. Isn't that wild? Well, I mean, because he MTV was everywhere, and he ran MTV. Um, but like one, you know, another time, uh, big. M- I want to say MTV two thousand two, the one Ashton Kutcher hosted, and he had a big after party at another guy's house, and everybody was there. But, I mean, it was a normal after party from, like, you know, 9 to, like, 2. It wasn't anything crazy. You know what I'm saying? It was, like, in a big public house that where you go, this huge billionaire's house that has a ton of parties to this day. Um, And everybody was there from tons of names. Um, But, like, executives, everybody. It was, like, amazing mishmash of people, but an amazing DJ, food, uh... I think there was another time I saw him at a Golden Globes party. But at least, like, these are the parties that the town goes to. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, but, like, every time I I've, I've once, you know, I saw him, he was always like, what's up? It was just not, not even just, like, a, a dap, and that was it. But I don't really know him, and I'm just, you know, I'm, but he's always been, you know, very nice to me. I don't, like, again, he wasn't, like, didn't really know him or hang with him. Why am I telling you this? Because... He got so big so fast, and I'm revisiting history of, like, how people do that. And I always thought it was hustle, but now I'm starting to think, like, maybe these deals happen. You know what I'm saying? So now you're hearing all this shit, and it's like, like, everybody knew that the dude took down, you know, women. Meaning he, you know, he had a lot, you know, he hooked up with a lot of chicks. That was always the rumor. I didn't hear the gay shit until, like, ten years ago potential gay shit uh i didn't hear of the other shit the ritual shit until like two years ago so that's what i'm saying the good news is is that like there is normal parties and i guess there's the after party i always tell people this here's what it is there's the good party there's the after party and then there's the super late night early morning party in some fucking warehouse in van nuys you know what i'm saying it's either up in the hill or in a warehouse in van nuys and that's where you, that's where things, and I was always out after the first after party. I was like, by that time, I was already too twisted up, or I might have grabbed a shorty or whatever, and we would have fun. I wasn't trying to have, by the way, I don't even like to pee in public bathrooms. So what these people are doing in front of people is insane. Like, the people are now talking about sex parties. There's some comedian I don't even know who was talking about sex parties, and it was brought to my attention, and I'm like, there's a amount of, like, I've never even seen this shit. That's what's crazy. And there's so much normalcy to go around. Where you can just meet and mingle and flirt with a girl and boom. You know, it could be on. Or it may be her and her friend and she's like, hey, it could be on. And you leave. You leave. And you go back to your spot or you go back to their spot or you're, you know, whatever. But it's not like all of this like fucking Sodom and Gomorrah and Bacchanal. I mean... Never my bag, never heard of it that much. It was like the darkest of rumors. You're like, what? But some lady was saying this recently about their sex parties, and I'm like, I don't really hear about it. But I'm also a big, like, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm into uh, STDs. I am not really think that's a good thing to get. But also, it's like, you're a comedian. Who the fuck is inviting you? You're a low-key open micer. Too much. Um. So, anyway, 
this shit's crazy because I actually I don't know if Hollywood will be brought down, but I feel like there's the keys to a lot of things through this. And basically what I'm starting to see is sometimes when these, a lot of times when I used to believe in the American dream and the hustle and all this stuff. And now I'm just really starting to believe that everyone's fucking compromised. I'm sorry. You know, the last guy I believe that did it was Ray Kroc. I mean, there's more, but I'm going to give Jeff Bezos a, a legit, he was a legit hit the, hit it, the ball out of the park at the right time, at the right place. Maybe I'm dumb. But Ray Kroc, look us up. Ray Kroc, who created McDonald's, seems like he was also at that lightning moment and he had the vision. But I don't know. It feels like there's a lot of these people, like they're placed and they get these crazy fucking deals. And it's like, I will say that some of your biggest celebrities, if you meet them at the right time, you can see the desperation in their eyes. Like, I've been desperate, but I've never been morally corrupt. And there's a way to look at someone's eyes who's eager, but there's eagerness and excitement and filled with wonder, and then there's whatever I got to fucking do, man. And you could see that in certain people's eyes. If you look at celebrities from when they were a little before mid-beginning to pop and then post-pop, you can watch, and very few, you could say, are content. But you can you can see a change, and if they are calmer, it's just because they're calmer because their life is no longer their own. I'm talking about the super high end, but um, the rest, like there, there are, but people, some people will do anything to escape their current existence, and I I think it's Lindsay Lohan who said, you know. Fame doesn't change you or doesn't. She said something that the brilliant take of it just exacerbates who you are. And which is if you love Funyuns and you become famous, you can buy a fucking room full of Funyuns because you can. You made a lot of money and people are up your ass to give you Funyuns. So if you got good habits, they're going to get better. If you have bad habits, they're going to get worse. And if you don't have anyone to help balance it, you know how it's going to go. So there's that, and then there's people that make deals. So a guy like Diddy, again, believe it or not, I know more about the music business than you think because I had a record deal. I had a record deal with Stu. We had a deal with Warner Brothers. To this day, I'm still they still haven't have recouped. And the guy who was my A and R was also Kendrick Lamar. I know, right? So they. It, it, the, the, when you really see how small the business is, it's like 50 said it perfect. He's like, um, it's like when I got paid and M got paid, when M got paid, then Dre got paid and Dre got paid and Jimmy got paid. Then Leora, it's basically like, it's like 50 was on under M, his label, which was under Dre, which was under Ivy, which is Interscope, which was under Lior Cohen, which was UMG. And then there's the guy that's the head of UMG. And then there's the guy that owns, you know, Universal, which is Bronfman or whoever it was at the time. So there's so many levels. And as you make a stink in one level, the top hears or the top likes you and pulls you the fuck up. And that's the same with any business. So do people pop off because they're amazing? Of course. But the shit... What you're hearing with the cameras and the tapes and, you know, I'm losing my train of thought, but here's what I want to say. There is a lot of, whether Diddy's a CIA asset, um, a straight up fucking, like, complete fucking, you know, sex pest. I don't know. There's a lot of fucking, there's a lot worse than that, but I don't know what I can say without, you know, being liable. Whether all these accusations are true and there's, there's these affidavits and shit that they're saying are intense. Like, there's just so much smoke, right? Um, but what I'm seeing is that I'm hearing is that, like, all these celebrities are going to be scared. And you, did you ever see celebs that you're just like, this motherfucker is A, kind of a bum, kind of a bum, and B, they're kind of fake earnest. And you're like... 
this dude is so fucking fake earnest and like puts on such a good front in front of the cameras. I'm like, that motherfucker is so dirty. Even if I didn't work in this business, my spidey sense goes, he's a little too much of a kiss ass. Like he's not being real. And now I'm starting to see it. I'm not going to say names yet. They're already out there. I'm just not going to, like, kick yet until, I, you know, unless stuff comes out. But I'm starting to see people that I always thought were bullshit artists and just, like, fake propped up, like, by the media, like, you know, fake good-looking, fake smart, fake talented, never had a real opinion off camera, just, like, a, you know, like, really didn't give a fuck. Always wanted to just make sure their money and their fame and had no fucking moral compass and never a fucking human emotion of kindness and just fakeness. Just bullshit. And always around different eras of other people that I thought were bullshit. And I'm like, this bullshit just adopted this bullshit and this bullshit. And I'm like, and they don't fuck with me. Do you know what I'm saying? This is what's crazy. I started thinking of this about myself and what I turned into a weakness became a superpower. Oh, I'm on one now. See, it takes a minute for me to kick in. Is they don't fuck with me in many ways. Like if I read for somebody that I think's bullshit movie and I'm in there doing a dance with them, they don't fuck with me because A, they get intimidated because I do go in and own my shit. And it doesn't mean you can't own your shit. If someone's great, like the other night, not to S my own D, and I've also been doing it 33 years, and I guess these guys are my peers, but they're bigger than me and made a bigger mark in comedy in terms of stand-up than I have, although I've made marks in other ways. I had to follow John Mulaney, who did his Oscar stuff, and it was hilarious. Hilarious. Like, it killed at the improv, and then he took it and killed on TV. It was, like, one of the highlights of this year's Oscars. And I had a really good set. And then I had to follow Bill Burr. And I'm like, fuck, this is like fucking double jeopardy here. <laughs> and I had a pretty damn good set. And I was like, these are things I don't enjoy doing. Like, I'm telling you that right now. Like, I don't enjoy doing that. These are monster comedians in the best way possible for the audience. But the worst way, if you got to follow them, because they're fucking masters at their craft. And so why am I saying this? I I respect them so much that I, you know, I it's intimidating. Uh, but I'm going to do it because that's how you get great. You get great by following or surrounding or learning from greatness. From greatness. You know, these are great, great minds. So it's like for me to not only play in that same sandbox, which I do, which I'm fortunate, you know, I've earned my space. But to follow is fucking, you know, to this day, it's like I can, I'm, I'm going to do it. But I'm like, fuck, man, I got to fucking make sure my shit's on, um, you know. And it's like, and it's like, but I also will go on a show and I'll be the only person that you know. And I'm sure younger comedians feel that with me. But I'm also learning from an unknown comedian because I got to stay on my shit. You know what I mean? Like there's new shit. But I do it because that's how you become great. And I lost my train of thought, but my train of thought was that there's just a lot of bullshit artists that really haven't put in the time or the work, but they got propped up. And I'm like, so, oh, when people don't fuck with me is because I will go in and like, but no matter what, what I'm saying is when I see greatness, even if I know it's going to be intense for me. I want to be next to it. Like, you know, I really learned that from Ellen. I know Ellen's got a lot of stink on her, you say, but she was so confident on her shows. And she gave me so many breaks. And she just said, you're funny. She's And I really believe in her soul. She's a comedian. um, Through and through, she's a, she's a comedian, a unique voice. And she, I remember doing her show, and she's like, give him more camera time he's funny and i'll never forget it. and i said that thank you for that i mean it's really, i'm like this is my brand new like second third job and she's like if if you're funny it makes my job so much easier because the whole show's funny and she had all she had so many funny people on her show you know jolie fisher piven um i forget his first name but 
Mr. Higgins, great actor. Like, just amazing people on her show. And she always encouraged everyone. So that's how I was raised. And, you know, funny begets funny. Talent begets talent. Um, But when you go into a room of a bullshitter, they'll fuck with you. They'll be intimidated. They don't want you to shine, you know, because they kind of are basically, um, what's the word? Imposter syndrome. A lot of people have that. Like, they really actually don't believe they have it. Um, and, and so the jobs I get, I've gotten are from confident people. Like, in a weird way, if you like a lot of stuff I've done, it's because I've worked with really talented people who just want to make good stuff and they hire the people that they think are good. You know what I mean? And so some of my best work is with people that really nurtured talent because they are very talented. You know, and whatever you think my level of talent is or isn't, it was never, it was always just, I just had fun because they got me. And some of the uncomfortable jobs I have, it's like maybe I was forced on these people that didn't like me or whatever. But like executives, I know certain rooms I go into, like the best executives who really pushed for me are people with a sense of humor, weren't exactly so corporate, creative guys that just happen to be in the bean counter side, but really fun, good dudes, like take you to Morton's three bottles of wine deep, tell stories, you know, get on the jet, you know, like that type of shit. Like I've had some amazing times, but there's not many great creative executives. A lot of them are just dull. 